Today on CityCast Philly, it's the Friday News Roundup. We're talking about takeaways from the general election, what's next for Mayor-elect Sherelle Parker, and current Mayor Jim Kenney's legacy. Who's the new police union president? And what we know about the embezzlement trial of former union leader John Doherty. It's Friday, November 10th. I'm Trina Nuri, and here's what Philly's talking about. Joining me this week is Chris Brennan, political reporter at the Philadelphia Inquirer and writer of the paper's clout column. Hey, Chris. Hey, happy to be back. Great to have you back. Marco Serino, reporter at the Philadelphia Tribune. Hey, Marco. Hi, Janae. Thanks so much for having me on again. Sure. And Mir Rindy, investigative reporter at Billy Penn. Welcome back, Mir. Hey, Trine. Glad to be back. Okay. So I just came across this story about Greyhound moving the bus station again. Have you guys heard about this story? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. What is happening? Like this. Oh, my gosh. I I feel for travelers because I have used Greyhound um, in my previous job before CityCast to get to New York City every day. And it was at, what was it, 10th and Filbert um, or 11th and Filbert. It was in the Greyhound bus hub. You know, on those rainy, cold days, I had a place to sit um, if I could grab a seat before the bus left. Then it transitioned to being on 6th and Market, 7th and Market. It's between 6th and 7th on Market. And now they're going to push it to Columbus and Spring Garden. I mean, has anyone taken Greyhound and can it, and just describe the experience of not having a bus station and like what that means? I think it's pretty clear here that the city was forced into a bad situation with Greyhound no longer having a facility. Uh, and uh, they were unhappy with how it looked on 6th and Market. And I think the unfortunate solution to that is to move it somewhere where people won't see it. Mm-hmm. So I've had a lot of experience taking mega bus, especially from the sixth and market stop for years. And I'm fairly comfortable with it, but I also live in the suburbs. So for me, it's, you get, you can get on and off and it's a five, it's about a five minute walk from the Paco stop at eighth and market. Now you're still near uh, an, an L stop there, but one you're near one that is elevated, so you're not dealing dealing with the subway. But what you are dealing with is a station that is not specifically ADA accessible. And see, that's a problem, right? Yeah, Marco, great point. Now, you can still pick up Megabus outside 30th Street Station. But but for Peter Pan, for, for Greyhound, people who are going from and to the Port Authority, it is going to be a jarring experience. And we'll talk more about the bus stop moving again next week. All right, let's get into some more news of this week. A lot of coverage around the general election. And now the voters have spoken. The city voted for its 100th mayor, Sherelle Parker. And this is historic, right? Because she's the first woman, first black woman to win the seat. Chris, I'm curious, what happens in the weeks leading up to the swearing in ceremony, right, for a mayor elect? Well, She's going to be approached by a lot of people who want jobs. And what she told us, she said, get your resumes ready during her victory speech. She sure did. There's a there's a thing about winning the mayoral primary, the Democratic primary for mayor in Philadelphia that uh, is not often spoken about because it's considered bad form to look like you expect to win the general election in November. Mm -hmm. But the minute you win the primary in May, candidates start planning their administration. So this administration has been being built since the middle of May. Um, they just don't talk about it because that would look disrespectful for voters. Yeah, not classy, yeah. yeah. Now, let's talk about this transition team. Are there any names floating around about who she's looking for as Philly's top cop? So there's a couple of names, um, but um, I frankly don't know who a front runner is in this situation. There is some speculation that, I mean, we, we definitely think whoever gets the job will have previously worn 
a Philadelphia Police Department uniform. The question is whether it's somebody who's currently employed by the department or if it's somebody who worked for the police department but then moved on to another job and would return to take the job. Got it. I thought it was really nice that current Mayor Jim Kenney sent out a tweet congratulating Parker on Tuesday saying, quote, congratulations to Mayor-elect Sherelle Parker on this historic win. I am proud to call Sherelle a friend and a colleague, and I look forward to working with her to ensure a smooth, successful transition that keeps our city's progress on track. What's Kenny's legacy as he's leaving office? So for Friday's clock column, we always ask during the primary and general election, candidates for office and elected officials the same three questions so that we could compare them. Our first question uh, on Tuesday for everybody was, what is Jim Kenney's legacy? We asked 21 people who hold office or are currently seeking uh, public office, um, and 11 of them said the soda tax. The soda tax is a, is a levy uh, on uh, sweetened beverages, which uh, only applies in the city of Philadelphia. If you go to an Acme and buy a bottle of Pepsi or a case of Coke, there's an additional levy on that. And that money goes into a fund, which is then used to renovate or even completely rebuild neighborhood recreation centers to fix up parks and recreation facility uh, and playgrounds, and also to fund pre-K programs. There were some dissenters um, who, for instance, former district attorney Lynn Abraham said that uh, Kenny's legacy would be as an inept do-nothing mayor. Uh, Council member uh, Jim Harrity said that the opioid crisis in Kensington would be his legacy. John Sabatino, who is now the Register of Wills elect, said that uh, his legacy was of being a disappointment. So, it varies depending on I yeah. guess who you ask. I would I would say though overall the soda tax, which makes sense because it is his one signature issue of eight years. Speaking of new leadership positions, Marco, you focused on the transition of power within the Philadelphia Police Union. That's the Fraternal Order of Police, or FOP. Former union head John McNesby resigned, and today is his last day on November 10th. He's being replaced by Vice President Roosevelt Lynn Poplar. Marco, can you tell us more about Poplar and his leadership style? Well, Poplar's a very interesting person because He's been in the spotlight before. If you see him in photos and footage of McKesby, he is often alongside the now departing president. Um, He is the first black individual to hold this position, a very important job. He's a 30 plus year veteran of the force. That's mostly what we know about him. He He hasn't done a lot of public stuff, but there's a new opportunity now with new leadership. Yes, John McNesby is going to a state job. He's going to the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Authority. So he's going to be doing, he's he's getting bumped up a bit to a state job. But Poplar comes in, does this mean everything's going to change overnight? It can't. Because a lot of the arbitration and rules regarding police, especially the termination, is bound by state law. All right. Well, we'll keep our eyes on that. Also, speaking of union leadership, you see how all the stories connect? Um, Mir, your story caught my eye about the embezzlement trial that is happening of former union leader John Doherty, who's also known by many as Johnny Doc. Mir, can you remind us who he is? Yeah, Johnny Doc or John Doherty, he was the longtime business manager of the uh, local electricians union, IBEW Local 98. And he was extremely powerful. The, the union poured millions of dollars into political campaigns, supporting candidates um, that, that uh, it agreed with ideologically or, or, or helped its, uh, its members um, for many years. But then he was indicted for corruption. It was alleged that he was bribing a a council member who was a union official as well. And uh, he was convicted a couple years ago. He's still out. He hasn't gone to jail, um, but he now faces a second trial 
on embezzlement charges. The feds allege that he and some other union employees spent something like $600,000 of union funds and resources on personal expenses. And he also potentially faces a third trial in the future. But yeah, the, the expenses are, uh, it's pretty interesting to look at the list. It's, a, it's like literally a laundry list, you could say. Lots of groceries, you know, breakfast cereal and, and stuff like that, restaurant meals, repairs to people's homes, like Doherty's family members. There were some some things that were purchased for his brother, Kevin Doherty, who's a uh, state Supreme Court justice. Just like every little thing you could imagine from Target, travel expenses, hotel expenses, uh, lots of things that don't seem at all related to union business. So this is money that the uh, members of the electricians union had contributed, had had paid in to help run the union and, and provide various services for them. But instead, it was supposedly going to all these other things that, that weren't connected to the union at all. So the big question here, Amir, is will he go to prison? Yeah, that is the big question. I mean, he was convicted a couple of years ago on, on several counts related to corruption. And the potential uh, sentence for for just for those charges was up to 20 years. Now, his uh, co-defendant, the former councilman, uh, Bobby Heenan, he got, uh, I think it's three and a half years, and he's actually started serving that already. So presumably, John Doherty would get a similar shorter sentence. And in fact, the Inquirer reported that he was offered a very minimal sentence, maybe a year or something like that, in exchange for pleading guilty to several charges or settling a, a few of the cases. He declined that, though. So now he has a second trial. If he's convicted, then that's more more charges that he's found guilty of. And so theoretically, it could be a heavier sentence um, than the three and a half years that Bobby Heenan got. But it's really hard to say. Probably there will be some sort of settlement or some sort of agreement, some sort of sentencing agreement at some point down the line. But it could be a ways off. There's still potential appeals and other things. So it's it's hard to know what will happen with his sentencing in the long run. Now, what does this trial mean for the power of the building trades unions, if anything? That's been a the kind of persistent question that people have, have talked about and, and written about. It's kind of hard to say. It doesn't seem like it has had a huge impact on the power of the electricians union or of the building trades um, generally, the, all, all those different unions that are grouped together. I mean, the Doherty is no longer the business manager there. They have new leadership. Um, they're still spending a lot of money on politics. According to figures I saw, they've spent, you know, at least $1.7 million on campaign contributions and campaign spending this year. And other building trades unions are spending a lot. The plumbers unions has already spent more than a million. The steam fitters spent more than a million. So there's plenty of money going out to candidates. And it's interesting that the the Building Trades Council, which is sort of an umbrella organization for a lot of these unions, they endorsed Sherelle Parker for mayor earlier this year. And that sort of helped her stand out from the pack of candidates, and she ended up winning the primary and then the general election the other day. So um, Johnny Doc is no longer part of that, but it doesn't seem to have uh, you know, affected their stride or their influence. Trine, I think it's worth noting that uh, Ryan, Ryan Boyer Boy, yeah. took over as business manager for the uh, Building and Construction Trades Council, which is an umbrella organization of about 30 unions. And Sherelle Parker just named him as the chair of his, her transition team. Mm -hmm. He was essentially second in charge of the Philadelphia Building and Construction Trades Council while it was led by John, Johnny Doc Doherty, who stepped down from that position after his first federal conviction. And he was in Sherelle Parker's corner from before she was a candidate. Two years ago, he was talking about her as a likely contender for the Democratic primary. And indeed she was. Uh, and the building trades came to support her in a way that was unusual this year, just in that it didn't all happen at once. 
Ryan Boyer got the building trades to endorse her in February, but the lo Local 98 of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, which has always been one of the most politically powerful unions in the Trades Council, they abstained initially. Uh, then the Carpenters, uh, which used to be part of the Trades Council, but then broke away, they endorsed Parker after the building trades, and then Local 98 came on board. A lot of powerful unions in this city, including the police union, too, that we mentioned earlier in the show. Yes. The end result of that was rather than looking like a fractured process, it was a wave of momentum at a time when Cheryl Parker's campaign was running behind other campaigns when it came to to uh, fundraising. So it was, uh, I think, a critical part of her coalition. And, every, you know, if you're going to win citywide in Philadelphia, you have to build a political coalition. All right. That was Chris Brennan, political reporter at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Marco Serino, reporter at the Philadelphia Tribune. And Mir Rendy, investigative reporter at Billy Penn. Thank you all so much for joining me this week on CityCast Philly. A pleasure as always. Thanks again. Thanks, Trinae. It's time for the tip of the week, where we share a life hack for living in Philly. Now, circling back to today's discussion, Mayor-elect Sherelle Parker is hiring. You can apply to work in the new Parker administration by visiting transition2023.org to explore the opportunities. We'll have a link in our show notes. If you have a tip of the week, we'd love to hear from you, too. Call or text us at 215 Two five nine eight one seven zero. That's all for today here on CityCast Philly. Ooh, what a week of episodes. Our lead producer is Laura Benchoff. Our producer is Abby Fritz. Our Hey Philly newsletter editor is Joel Wolfram. And our host is me, Trinae Nuri. Music is by Philly's own Interminable, with additional music from All the Kimonos and James Weldon. If you enjoyed this week of episodes, tell a friend, tell your neighbor, tell your coworker, rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to our morning newsletter, Hey Philly. We'll be back Monday morning with more news from around the city. Have a great weekend, y'all, and be safe. Bye. Bye.